can, can y'all just be honest? It's a little chaotic out there right now. Nothing's normal. Man, nothing, nothing, nothing is normal. I'll tell you this. we got a lot of things happening here at Relevant Church. Uh, we're trying to show the community we love them, we believe in them. Uh, and we have determined at Relevant Church that this is a long game, not a short game. Like it is a long season. And ultimately we know that while everybody's not comfortable in church, while everybody's not comfortable in the building, while uh, stupid rain moved in for our outdoor service today and all the stuff that happens with that, all those things are happening. What we know is there's going to come a time where people are looking for hope and looking for answers. And so we are out in the community with this mission face. Uh, campaign. You can get all your stuff at the resource center if you want to buy that. But we have the pink elephant in the lobby. It's going to be at Queen Bee. Anybody like some coffee in the house? Come on. Coffee. Any Queen Bee fans? Yeah. So we're going to be at Queen Bee this weekend. We need some volunteers to just go out. We're just driving people to local businesses and loving on the community in the process. So sign up at the pink elephant. We need about a dozen volunteers to go out and be a part of that and love on our community. And man, we had a lot of fun. Where my men at to play some football yesterday? Y'all still in bed at home? Where y'all at? Yeah, so we had a little fun yesterday. And then the ladies, y'all did a little something, uh, something, something exercise on y'all here. Come on, the ladies first. Sir. They must have all been in first. So we got one, one lady. I'm here. All of my friends I slept in this morning. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we have a lot of things going on, but we are, we got a lot of people trying to take their health seriously. And I'm excited about that. We got good life, all the different things that are happening here at Rally. I say all that to say, I had a great conversation at the end of our men's uh, day yesterday, just hanging out with some guys, not a ton of us, but one guy was talking about, uh, and I won't mention any names, he just said, look, man, we just moved here recently, and we're just looking for, to hang out and develop spiritual friends and family, and, uh, you know, I, I just love to be a part of anything you guys are doing, if y'all are going out for coffee or dinner or whatever, I just thought was a pretty cool thing for a guy to say. We got a lot of pride as men, and uh, it was really cool, and then we just, been, people can begin to share and say, yeah, man, I'm, I went through first step, next step, heart and soul, got connected, found community, I went through the good life, and it changed my life. I'm saying all that to say, if you're not connected, and you're not trying, that's your fault. Now, if you're showing up events on your phone, it's your fault. There are opportunities for you to connect. If you're isolated and you feel alone, we're trying to build that spiritual family here. So do your best to come out of your comfort zone. Take a step because your next step is your best step. All right? Uh, jerseys, people ask where you can get them. Stop by the Resource Center pre-orders. They'll be in uh, for October 10th. Our birthday celebration. You guys excited about that? Three weeks from now. Come on, we turn 11 years old. Pre-teen weird years, y'all. This is where we all get weird and start, our body starts changing and things. No, that's weird. Okay, so um, we're in the middle. We're starting out today a three-week series. Um, and uh, I, I just want to tell you where this series comes from. Okay, this series was birthed a few weeks back when I was sitting down with one of our staff. And uh, they were saying, hey, where, where are you headed in your message in about 10 days? And usually um, we're two, three months out with outlines and kind of what we're doing with the series. But there's this window of time from now until October 3rd where I was like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to talk about, you know. Uh, and uh, it's not like every day I just get up and figure this out. There's a lot of planning and seasonal things that come in. January we talk about new, new beginnings. And, you know, August we talk about changes in school. And then February is a great time to talk about love and Valentine's and all that. But what you talk about on fall break? So, like, I try to be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, and I was literally sitting there, and they were, we, I was talking to one of our staff, and they said, so what, where are you going? I said, I don't know. And so what's the deal? Like, why are you? And I said, I just feel like this clog in my brain. I can't figure it out. And I said, I literally feel like, and I said these words, and then I said a follow-up statement. The word I said was, um, I just feel like things are so out of control. And then I paused, and I said, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I feel like things are out of my control. Now, any control freaks in the house, come on. Therapy time, reds, any of my reds in the house, you know what I mean? Like, okay, your temperament is a red, and so at the end of the day, I, uh, I'm a red. I like to at least, I'm not, have to, I'm not a control freak, but I sure don't like to be out of control either, you know what I mean? And so uh, it was a little bit of uncomfortable, and I said, I just feel like, man, things are wild and out of control, and I think people's minds, the chaos around us, uh, not knowing what tomorrow holds, everything is changing so rapidly, and people are just lost, and I said, I just... I just feel like things are out of control. And he looked at me and he said, well, why don't you just make that your next message series? And I said, why don't you just shut up? And, uh, and so here we are. Uh, I think some of the greatest and most impactful messages are not the illustrated ones. They're not the funny ones because I can't keep up with Reggie from last week. I'm just going to say it like it is. And, uh, and then uh, I think some of the most meaningful ones sometimes are the ones that just come from the heart. And so uh, I take you back to a couple years ago. We were at a baseball tournament. And uh, any Checkers fans, any Checkers fans, like not Checkers, like, like food Checkers, like the drive-in thing. Yeah, Checkers, like the fries is about all I can handle, but Checkers tries. Okay, so we, the only place, we only had a few minutes between games, and we drove through the Checkers drive-in, and i never forget, the, my, my boy said, I want a hamburger with cheese, ketchup, and mustard. That's what he said. I said, all I want. So I go through the drive-thru, and I said, I want, I want a hamburger with cheese, ketchup, and mustard. 
only. And he said, so you don't want any meat? If that dude would have been standing right beside me, he would not have an Adam's apple left. I'm just going to say. Like, I was like, are you, what? I, I said, ham, burger. The ham is already on there. It's a given, you moron. He was trying to be funny in front of his friends. So we pull up to the thing, and I about lose my mind. And I said, look, I'm going to, I'm, I, can I speak to your manager? And he goes, uh, I am the manager, sir. And my wife now, she is gentle, she is calm, but when she gets over the edge, it's going to be a little, a little scary. And so she said, she leaned across and she goes, sir, I am certain you are not the manager. <laughs> and I was like, get him, girl, you tell him, you tell him, you get him. And I'm like, because I'm like, y'all know those people? Okay, so I tell you that from two years ago, because like literally I feel like that is the, the world we live in right now. Like everybody's just doing stupid stuff, saying stupid stuff. Uh, the, 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 the customer service world, oh my word, come on somebody. So we had a thing uh, Thursday night, a uh, soccer game, and my youngest boy, he played really well. And I said, man, I'm taking him to his favorite restaurant. We'll, we'll get him some ice cream, do whatever. And uh, so we rode down the road, and we go, and we pull in, and we start to go in. We just want to sit down in the dining room, right? Come on, y'all remember when we didn't have dining rooms to sit down in? Like, I just wanted to go to Chick-fil-A and sit down in Chick-fil-A. Anybody else with me? Like, you remember those days, I just want to sit down. And eat my Chick-fil-A. And so uh, this is not Chick-fil-A, by the way. So we pull up at this restaurant, and we're going in. And I open the door, and oh, my gosh, the smell. The sewage was clearly backed up. And I opened it, and I was like, oh. I thought it was like somebody, is there, is there a toilet here I'm not seeing? What is the deal? And so I was like, okay. So I opened, and Julie's like, I don't know if I can do it. So we opened the next door to go in, and it was like, oh. And I literally was like, oh. And the people behind the counter are watching me go, and I just turned back around, and I walked back out, and they were like this. I'm like, listen, it takes a four-year-old to know you got to shut that restaurant down, y'all. They were just still slapping mayonnaise on burgers and serving them out. And I'm like, ugh, how can you do that? So then we go down the street to his second favorite fast food restaurant. You can tell we're healthy eaters. And so uh, we go down the street to his second favorite restaurant, and it says dining room open. Y'all want to bet? Dining room went open, so we got to go to round three. So we get to the third place, the third place. Uh, so, okay, well, well, I, what do you want? And so we're going through the line. I said, I want a steak salad. Start fixing my salad. She said, what do you want on it? And I said, steak. She goes, oh, we out of steak. <laughs> I just ordered a steak salad. And I thought to myself, like, I know that is Humorous and some of y'all like, you don't know how hard it is to get workers. I get it. Some of y'all are trying to pay $15, $20 an hour and people still ain't working. Here's the premise that I'm trying to tell you. Things just are seemingly out of control, aren't they? Nothing is normal anymore. And normal wasn't very good sometimes anyway. I mean, it, it feels like what you plan today may not be the same tomorrow. We started an outdoor service last week, a viewing option. We had people come and be a part of that. We had more families that said, hey, I can't wait to come this weekend. It wasn't a ton of people, but it was an opportunity for people to get out of the house. So what does it do today? Out of our control. We're up at 545 this morning. One of our staff checking the weather, making sure. He said, like, what do you, so what do you do? And so this message is not going to be fun. It's not going to be funny. My hope is it is introspective. That it's a reflection of like, okay, God, things may be out of my control, but what, what, what can I expect? How, how can I view the world through a healthy way? So this is a passage uh, in, in Mark chapter number four. We'll read it in a moment. But the disciples are on a boat with Jesus, and it's Jesus' idea, by the way. Uh, so if you get on a boat with Jesus, it's Jesus' idea. You kind of think, okay, we're good, right? Well, there's a storm that comes up, and the disciples freak out. So that's where we pick up in Mark chapter number four, verse 35. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took he took him along just as he was in the boat. So they took Jesus. Like he said, let's go. Let's get away from the crowd. Let's just, I just want to be with you guys and, and spend some time with my disciples. And so there were also other boats with him. So there's several boats. And as they're going across the sea there, it says, a furious squall came up and the waves broke. Squall sounds like something my grandma would have said, right? Squall. Are you squalling, boy? Quit squalling. Quit your squalling. Y'all remember that? Y'all got, okay, she, her name was Big Mama, by the way. I love my Big Mama, man. And so she would say, you need to quit your squalling. So the squall came up, and it said the, 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 the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, this ain't little, little patty cake waves. I mean, it's coming over the boat. Things are going to and fro. Things are out of their control. Where's Jesus? He's supposed to be on the boat. So it says Jesus was in the stern. This is my favorite part. Sleeping on a cushion. Brought on bought his like snuggle pillow with him. You know, he's sleeping on a cushion. 
And they're up there getting thrown to and fro. And it says, the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? No, let me pause. Have you ever felt this way? God, yo, do you even care that my marriage is out of control? Do you even care that I can't keep my business afloat? Do you even care that my financial situation is spiraling out of control? Do you even care that my kids are rebelling? Do you even care that I want my kids to go off to school, not at home in school? Come on, somebody. Do you even care? Where are you? Do you even care if I drown in this world? <laughs> Jesus don't even respond. He says he got up. He didn't even talk to them. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be quiet, be still. Some translations say, peace, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. I just want to be like a fly on the wall and be like, what would what, 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 what you just do, man? And he said, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then they were terrified and they asked each other, who, who is this? Even the wind and the waves Obey him. So at this point, they just saw him as teacher. Now they're starting to see some supernatural powers that Jesus has. And this is an incredible story because, man, it's going crazy. We say, Jesus, help. And he goes, stop, be still, and everything's okay. But can I tell you, that is not the way it usually works. Our preference is that we don't face storms, right? That we don't face uncertainty, that it just doesn't happen. That is our first. If I'm choosing A or B, I'm saying, no, I want to I know what's going to happen. I'm choosing A. But if, in fact, we are going to go through storms, and if, in fact, there is going to be uncertainty in our life, uh, if we have A or B, God bring immediate peace, or B, let it linger, we're choosing A again, right? But that's not how it works. And so we're going to look today specifically at a dramatic moment in human history. Jesus is uh, telling his disciples that we are going to an upper room at the secret location in a home of an upper, upper room of a home, and he's gathering his disciples for the Passover meal before he's about to die. You say, what is the Passover? Well, it's a celebration that the Jewish people would come together annually to commemorate um, the night before the morning that the Jewish people would be delivered from slavery. And so they were, they were, they were coming through, and, and every year on this Passover meal, they would celebrate, they would eat together, and they would remember the goodness of God for the people of Israel. And so... The Israelites had been in captivity. They had seen slavery and bondage and mistreatment for 400 years. And seemingly during that 400-year period, there were no answers to their prayers. Where was God in all of this? And somewhere at the tail end of that 400 years, God raises up a man by the name of Moses. And Moses would lead the children of Israel out of captivity across the Red Sea. And then they'd still wander for years in the wilderness knowing, God, where, where is the promise going to come? Things are out of their control. And God was leading them to become a nation. And so every year at Passover, that the, the Jewish people would celebrate what had happened at that moment. And now some 1,500 years have passed. And Jesus, 1,500 years after the Passover, Jesus gathers his disciple, disciples to commemorate this, this, this meal, this feast. Here's the problem. The disciples are distracted. Things aren't going very well. Their popularity has diminished. See, there was a day when Jesus was walking around healing people and he was taking fish and chips, five loaves and two fish and turning it into a Captain D's drive through Like when he was doing all of that stuff and the miracles are flowing, everybody loved Jesus and his disciples, but some things had shifted. Just days earlier, he goes through and they say, hell, king of the Jews, and they're waving the palm branches on him. We know this is Palm Sunday before Easter. Palm Sunday, he's king of the Jews, but then they realize, wait a second, we wanted a political king. He's not a political king. He's everything but a political king. So they turn on him. And so secrecy now, uh, after their popularity is diminished, they have to go into secret to celebrate the Passover because Jesus is about to be arrested and die. He's talking about his death, and the disciples are wigging out. Judas is acting strange. Um, the uncertainty that they had grown comfortable with for so three plus years now was gone. They had more questions than they had answers. What are we going to do if Jesus leaves? And now why are we meeting in secret? Why are we at night? What's going to happen when you're arrested? How are we going to survive? And we pick up in Matthew chapter number 14, beginning of verse 17, and it goes like this. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, truly I tell you, 
one of you will betray me who is eating with me. Now that's not good news. I was coming here to hang out. Now you're going to tell us one of us is going to betray us. And he says, they were saddened and one by one they said to him, surely you don't mean me. Now let's pause. If we could rewind some 18 plus months ago. I would look, most people, some people that aren't even here today, maybe from other churches that fell away from church or from our church that haven't been to church, people watching online, and you're kind of tossed to and fro in your faith. There are more people, if you'd asked them 18 months ago, do you love Jesus? Would you ever turn your back on Jesus? Are you committed to Jesus? Do you want to follow Jesus with your life? And they'd say, yes, 18 months later, gone. Where are you at? The disciples, one by one, are like, not me. <laughs> I'm so glad that we have other people that struggle the same way we do, we can look back at. And, it said, and Jesus says, it is one of you 12, he replied. One who dips his bread into this bowl with me. So they go around, he's dipping this bread into this bowl. And Judas, boom, same time. Oh, you're going to betray me. So all this transpired. Then we pick up a few verses later. It says, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him had he not been born. Now listen to me. The disciples are in a very uncertain situation. The uncertainty is very real. The tensions are very high. Jesus, their anchor, their comfort, their peace is leaving. They have questions. They have doubts. They have fear. It is out of their control. You may want to write this down. I love this. Much of the Bible was written in extreme uncertainty. This is not about rich people having fun, is it? See, we are rich in America. We are wealthy in America. We have a lot of opportunity in America. And sometimes we read it through a very wealthy, Americanized mindset. But that is not the way the Bible was. It was written in extreme uncertainty. I mean, Monday, your kid didn't get the scholarship. And then Tuesday, your kid got the job. And by Wednesday, he's promoted and got a raise. And so one of your other kids, they became a pro athlete. And then they got married. And they lived happily ever after. And there was no divorce in the land. That's not the Bible. You understand? If it were that, it'd be easy. Just prescribe a formula, do what they do, figure it all out, live happily ever after. But listen, the Bible tells us something. And that is that in the midst of uncertainty, God is still certain. Let that sink in. In the middle of right, right now, in the middle of your uncertainty, in the middle of our worldwide and nationwide and local and homes and personal uncertainty, God is and was and has always been still certain. What happens when you can't even trace God's hand? Well, the Bible tells us he's still trustworthy. Let's look at a few characters. And Joseph, in the Old Testament, Joseph, not, not, not Mary and Joseph, Joseph. Joseph, from the Old Testament, he had 12 brothers. He's sold into slavery. But before he was sold into slavery, he was thrown into a well or a cistern. And they began to talk, are we going to kill him or are we going to sell him into slavery? That's a bad day when you got those two options. Your brothers are saying, "My dad, the dad, dad loves him more than he loves us. So either we're going to kill him or we're going to sell him into slavery. And he sells him into slavery. It's 20 some odd years before the dream that God had given Joseph come, to, Joseph come to pass. And some 16 plus years of that were pure hell. God, where are you at? All, in, all kinds of uncertainty. Prison cells. False accusations. This brother had been through it all. Fast forward, King David, who would become the king of the nation of Israel, known as a man after God's own heart, not perfect, but known as a repentant man after God's own heart, wakes up one day and he hears his son conspiring to kill him. Uh, this is a fun day. Moses, who would rescue the children out of Egypt, the Israelites out of Egypt, his, he was born, his mother puts him in a basket, wraps him in a blanket and sends him down a river. What's going to happen to this boy? I don't know. It's out of their control. Paul, in the New Testament, after Jesus is resurrected, is called by God to take the gospel to the then known world, but he finds himself in a Roman prison. Out of his control, he writes the words, to live is Christ. In other words, if I get out of here and I live, I'm going to live for Jesus. If I die, it's gain. I'm going to go be with Jesus. I gain Christ in eternity. But either way, whether I live or die, it's Jesus. But he writes to the church and he says, what do you do when God's promises don't seem to be coming true? He says, God is still certain, even when you're not. God is still in control even when your life seems out of control. So in our times of certainty, people, friends, family, listen to me, brothers, sisters, 
in our times of uncertainty, there's a great place for us to look. It is not Facebook. It is not Twitter. It is not Instagram. It is not TikTok. It is not CNN or MSNBC or Google or Yahoo or whatever browser you prefer. It is the B-I-B-L-E. And I know when you read the Old Testament, you're like, what? 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 Extreme uncertainty. Extreme uncertainty. But God, listen, when we find ourselves in the middle of this, we have to understand this statement. And you may want to take a picture of it. You may want to write it down. God is not absent. He is often diligently at work accomplishing his will in this world and in the lives of those that he loves. Yeah, if you're going to do it, do it right. Some of y'all are like, yeah, but church, you don't know what I'm going home to. She's so mean, Pastor. Uh, along the curved wall out in the lobby, there is a prayer and care room. We have people there for you at the end of this message today. Whew, somebody needs to teach him slow to speak, quick to listen. And I'm beginning to have to trust something in a new way. See, I've had to trust this at seasons of my life that were shorter. I'm having to trust that even when the world is out of my control, it's not out of God's control. That's easy for Monday through Wednesday. It's not easy for a year and a half. It's not easy for five years. It ain't, some of y'all been in bad situations. You had your kids rebel for 10 years. Or five. You got, you got, you got you know, situations in your life you've been dealing with for far longer than 18 months, and you have to lean into the grace of God and believe that he's still in control. And so the Bible challenges us to trust him when it's hard to find him, when it's hard to understand him, or when you might manage things different than he does. And so the story continues. And because we know the end of the story, because we get to look back and go, oh, that's what happened. You see, the next few words have extraordinary significance because we know and we get to see it fulfilled, but they don't. The disciples don't know the end of the story. I mean, Jesus tells them, but come on. Like, they had a lot of promises broken in their life. And so Jesus tells them the end of the story and the significance of the story and tells them what was about to happen. And, you know, he don't even tell them the whole story. They're still piecing everything together. But we get to look back and go, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. But we weren't sitting in the moment of darkness with them. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it. This is my body. Now, what we believe is this is a symbol of the body and blood of Jesus. Now, there are some... Um, teachings in, in, in the Christian circles, the broader Christian circles, that this was actually the body of Christ. We believe it was a representation of the body of Christ, not the literal body of Christ, because Christ hadn't died yet. Okay, and so this is a representation. He said, take it. This is my body that was broken for you, he goes on to say. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant. This word covenant is huge, meaning that God has made a covenant that cannot be broken with humanity. When Jesus dies and is resurrected and sheds his blood for the world, he's making a covenant that began at the beginning of time when, Jesus, when God made it, but Jesus is fulfilling it and promising that I will make a way for you to have eternal, eternal life with, with my Father. And so then he makes this covenant which was poured out for many. This word covenant is lost in our culture, isn't it? Do you know when you get married in our culture, husband, wife, man, woman, I won't go into the graphic details, but a blood covenant is established when you consummate the marriage. That's God's design. Covenants are not meant to, they're not contracts. That's why marriage is not a joke. It's not fun. You don't get to play around and go, ah, I just tried this a few times. This is where God says, you know, no, I, I wanted you to find somebody to help you reach your full potential in Jesus. And listen, have you been through a divorce? You've been through, I'm not, I'm not picking up what I'm saying. is like, we just, we've, we've set you up for failure in our culture. And so Jesus is foreshadowing an event that is about to change history. An event that would be celebrated for 2,000 years. We know it to this day as Easter Sunday. And it won't stop in 2021 or two or three, no matter what. It ain't stopping until this world ends and Jesus reestablishes his new kingdom. But God is about to make, listen, God is about to make a move on behalf of the world. But everything seems to be moving backwards. It seems to be getting worse for the people in the picture. 
God is about to do the greatest thing in the history of the world, but surrounding the people in the picture, it seems like utter chaos out of their control. And to make it worse, have you ever been to somebody's house and it just didn't go so well? Like you went for a meal, I was like, that was bad. Don't point. So you've had a bad night, it was miserable, it didn't go as you planned. You're up in arms, you're like, golly, I just, I don't know, I'm just ready to get away from here. And then as you're leaving, they take a jab and say something at you. You're like, oh, no, you didn't. So as they're leaving, listen to what Jesus says to the disciples. <laughs> you will all fall away. <laughs> Wait, what? Like, we, come on now. And Jesus told them, for it is written and prophesied, I will strike the shepherd, meaning Jesus would die, and the sheep will be scattered, meaning you and I, and all them at that time. He says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. What he's saying is there's a, while all the chaos and all the uncertainty, you're going to fulfill all those things that don't make any sense. I'm going to come back and reveal myself to you and show you that, that I am who I say I am. And so Peter, boy, Peter's a contradiction. He was Simon, then he was Peter. Then he was trying to rescue Jesus, and Jesus calls him Satan. But Jesus also told him, on this rock, I'll build my church. By the way, get behind me, Satan. That's weird. Like, I don't get it. Like, Peter's, I feel like Peter sometimes. Like, I'm like, I love Jesus. What am I doing wrong? I love Jesus. What am I, y'all feel that way? Peter, though, sounds like all of us when we think we can do it on our own. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Um, Because Peter was going to try to control the situation. He'd been doing this all. Remember when the Roman soldiers, they come to cut Jesus, uh, arrest Jesus. He takes a sword and like, ha! Cuts the dude's ear off. And Jesus is like, bruh, puts the ear back on. I would, that would have been amazing to see. Peter's trying to control everything. It's out of his control. He don't know what to do. And here's the thing. He couldn't, he couldn't even stay awake just a few hours later when Jesus goes to pray. He's like, y'all stay here and pray. Peter's over there snoring. I ain't falling away. Y'all know those people. They're almost too spiritual for their own earthly good. Like they, don't, like they don't even know that like, hey, yeah, you pretend sometimes. See, Peter had to have another encounter with Jesus that really changed him. He couldn't stay awake, and he's about to be humiliated, minus Judas, more than all the rest of them. He's going to deny Jesus three times. The third time he's outside warming his hands by the fire as Jesus is being uh, on trial, and he's about to go to the cross. And here's, here's where I want you to understand I feel like our culture is. Right now in this moment, there are so many Christians today that have lost themselves in these seasons. What they've done is tried to control the narrative. They've been trying to chase safety, trying to chase certainty, screaming across the aisle at people they disagree with because everything's out of their control. So if I can say it loud enough and say it louder for the people in the back and say it louder for the people online, I can control the narrative. Here, let me, let me raise awareness to something. You and I are not in control. And all the hate language and all, you know why we're doing this? More often than not, I see people lashing out about uncertainty and chaos and trying to control everything around them because deep down in their soul, there's some things out of order. And so when things get uncomfortable, we lose our mind because we feel like we're losing control. But listen to me, we are not called to be comfortable. We are called to be faithful. And that word has been lost in the last 18 months. It's not happening in the church in America today. It's not happening with our time. It's not happening with our obedience. It's not happening with our resources. We do what, whatever comes, our priorities are jacked, aren't they? Let's be real candid. All of us have been guilty. So here's a question for us today, and we're going to wrap up here in a moment. As we face personal, national, and even worldwide uncertainty, I want you to ask yourself this question. I'm going to throw it on the screen, take a picture of it, you write it down, I'm going to read it a couple of times. Because the answer to this question is a game changer. Here it is. Is it possible that God is still active, accomplishing his purposes when there's no indication of his activity? Is it possible that God is still active, still accomplishing his purposes when there's no indication of his activity? Here's another way of saying it. When things seem out of control. Is it possible that God is still in control doing things that we cannot see? He's active in your world and in the world. Listen, 
how you respond, when everything seems to be going backwards, when darkness is hovering over, when you don't know what's happening, when chaos and uncertainty strike, yours and mine, our answer to that question will determine our response to our current uncertainty. But if we could interview the disciples today, if we could sit them down and say, hey, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, I don't know how to say that, and ask them, What's the darkest? What was the darkest hours? My suspicion would be that they would say, oh, right after the Passover, it got really dark. It got weird. And then when Jesus was hanging on the cross and darkness came over the land and he died and they took him off and they put him in a tomb, I freaked out. I went back fishing. I went back to my old life because I was so uncertain. I had doubts. I had fears. I didn't know what to do. I, I suspect at least a good portion of the disciples would say, those moments, those moments were the darkest, most uncertain hours. But with the clarity of hindsight now, if they could look back and see what we see, I think if we asked them, well, when did God accomplish his greatest work? Well, that's like three days later. <laughs> like when he came out of the tomb and like nobody could find him. And then he said, look, I got the nail scar. Like, oh, yeah, that was good. Because they see it. Ah, oh, I see it now. What am I trying to say? There's a correlation between darkness and light. Between death and life. Between uncertainty. Here we go. And faith. And we had nice little slogans, and I don't even know where they came from, so don't send me hate mail. Faith over fear. I'm scared to death right now. In fact, I got a few other words. I'm scared, you know what, right now. Right? That's the way people pan. Don't tell me they want some panic in all of us. And that, that little cliche sounds amazing, but when you hear the backstory, it takes on so much more meaning, doesn't it? And so that was the beginning of three days of utter despair. Utter despair for the disciples. <laughs> but it was also the culmination of God's plan of redemption for all of humanity. That they've been waiting on for thousands of years. When life is uncertain, God is not. When the world, when my world is out of my control, it is not out of God's control. And when we can see we can trust God is working when we cannot see him, there's a sense and a purpose, a, a, a sense of purpose and peace that emerges in our soul. So when I can trust and believe that God is still at work, even though I can't see him working right now, I don't know what's going on, but I can trust there is a peace that transcends all understanding that can guard our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. Here's the problem. That peace won't get me a better paying job. The peace won't pay my bills, pastor. It won't keep my kids in school. It won't restore my 401k. It won't make sure my employees don't you know, quit. It won't, it won't make my wife be nicer. It won't make my husband be nicer. It won't bring my prodigal child home that's rebelling and turning away and turning to drugs. It won't, it won't do any of that. You are right. But the peace of God is one of the greatest gifts that God could have ever given us. It'll allow you to go to bed at night with the confidence that God has not abandoned you. It'll motivate you to be on the lookout for his grace and his intervention in the middle of all the chaos. It's not something that you can always touch or feel, but there's something that happens inside. It'll motivate you. It'll inspire you. It'll keep you from leaning into directions and into things that only make things worse. God, I'm isolated. God, I'm lonely. Let me go have a few beers. God, I'm isolated. God, I'm lonely. Let me jump into a bad relationship. God, I'm isolated. God, I'm lonely. I'm going to go look at something I shouldn't look at. God, I'm isolated. God, I'm lonely. I feel lonely. I'm going to, I'm going to push back against my spouse. God, I'm isolated. God, I'm lonely. I'm just going to go out and do everything. FOMO, YOLO, only live once. I'll catch up later with you, Jesus. It'll protect you in times of despair. It'll challenge you to be a faithful and obedient in any circumstance. That's what the peace of God will do. And so then, 
There's a lot you can't control. But there's a lot you can control. I almost made a list, but I didn't want to be too in your face today. You know what you can't control? Your attitude. Oh, snap. He did not go there. Yeah, I did. You can control what the fingers tweet, too, can't you? You can control your mouth. You can control, ready for this, what you spend your money on. Some of y'all don't have peace because you keep buying stuff and you can't afford it. You can control what you put in your body and be healthier. You can't control if COVID gets in your body. I get that. But you can control if you're getting healthier. You understand many people are spiritually struggling because they're physically struggling. They feel like crap all the time because they eat like crap all the time. They don't exercise. They don't take care of themselves. And listen, I got some major pains that I have to work through in my physical body. I go home from church on Sundays and I lay on the couch because my back is throbbing every single Sunday. Been doing it for a decade. And so here's the thing. You can control your priorities. Listen to me online. Lean in. Some people that are watching online today, you're watching because you literally are not comfortable. And you have there's some legitimate reasons for you to stay disconnected. Other people are watching online today because it's more convenient. Those are not the same thing. You are meant to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You go to football games and sit in 50,000 person stadiums or 4,000 people stadiums across town here. Go everywhere else, but God becomes the fifth priority. And I had pastors six weeks after COVID hit, people were yelling and screaming at their people. I never yell and scream at our people for nothing, but, but there comes a point where, come on, you got to ask yourself, really, why am I doing what I'm doing? And it's wild right now, I get it. But the peace of God that transcends all understanding can guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, if you're running your life into the ground, you're running your schedule into the ground, you're running your finances into the ground, you're running everything else in the ground, and you're going, God, give me peace. He's going, ha, 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 ha. You do this first. I'm trying to give you peace and you keep throwing it up and juggling it like it's some kind of freaking circus. I'm trying to give you peace and you're just playing with it. You wonder why life feels out of control. Listen, I'm tired of seeing people walk away from their faith. I'm tired of seeing people isolated, lonely, abandoned, taking their own life in depression. I want to see you whole. But it's up to you. And it's up to me to take personal responsibility, control what I can control, not in an unhealthy way, but trust that when I can't control, God is in control. Would you stand with me? Let's close our eyes for a moment. We're going to sing this song together one more time as we close. With nobody looking around just for this moment, God has been every single week for the last eight or nine weeks, man, we've had three, four, five, 10, 20, 30 people receive Christ in our church. And nobody look around. You say, what does it mean to receive Christ? It means to say, God, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm not following you. I have sin in my life that I haven't let go of. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins and be Lord of my life. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was resurrected so that I can die to my old self and I can have new life. That is the gospel, the good news. You know what the gospel is? It's good news in the face of bad news. The bad news is without Jesus, we're eternity apart from God. The good news is with Jesus, we get to spend eternity with God in heaven. So nobody's looking around and saying, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me my sins. I want to start this journey of following him. I don't fully understand what it means or what it looks like, but I'm going to start that journey today. And I want him to be Lord of my life. When I say three, I want you to lift your hands. Come on, one. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you've been here a long time. Two, three. Come on, lift them up all across this room. Yeah, I see your hands in the back. Yeah, I see your hands to my left. Yeah, half a dozen hands at least. Mm. Just give you a couple more seconds. Yeah, families of people raising their hands. If you lifted your hand, I want you to whisper these words to God. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross, confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You'll be given a new life in Christ. Whisper these words. Dear God, I come to you right now asking you to forgive me of my sins. Be Lord of my life. Help me to live for you from this day forward. To recognize you're good and you're faithful. I believe Jesus died on the cross, was put in a tomb, and was resurrected in my place. Help me to take my life and worship you with everything that I have. Today I call you my Savior and I call you my Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, at least 14 people made that decision to follow Jesus today. Come on. Yeah. Welcome to the family. Listen, if you lifted your hand or if you're online and you prayed that prayer, listen, I want you to do something. 
There's a QR code in the seat back in front of you. You can scan that, and there's a link on there on MyRelevant.cc. You can say care at my relevant, uh, uh, care at relevantchurch.cc or MyRelevant.cc, either one of those. Send us a message. Let us, let us know you prayed that prayer. What I'd prefer you do, though, is stop by our prayer and care room. There are people there who would like to greet you and just tell you, hey, Monday's coming. See, tomorrow you don't get to sit in your office and hear me inspire you and challenge you. So go and figure out what your next steps are. We got